Good evening, everybody. We want to welcome you to our midweek Wednesday night uh, service on air, online. And uh, uh, we also want to invite you to come out tomorrow night, Thursday night at 7 o'clock to uh, our CFI service, Coffee, Fellowship, and Issues. And I think this week's going to be a really good one. So, But anyway, uh, I suppose you're wondering why, Trenton asked me why I had two shirts on. Well, I uh, this is my Royal shirt. Brenda got it for me for Christmas, birthday, Father's Day, Sunday. I can't remember which day she got it for me. But it's all about the Royals. And I'm, uh, I just want to bring out one little point. I'm a loyal Royal fan. Even though they're not doing good, I am still loyal to the Royals. And that is just one aspect of my life. I'm, I'm a loyal person, and I, I like that. I, I think people should be loyal. So that's just a little free lesson tonight why I'm wearing this that even though they're not on top I'm still a Royals fan may even and uh, that's the way I am with everything in life and I uh, just am loyal to what God has given me tonight I want to discuss uh, uh, something about old shrines I don't know if anybody here has an old shrine in their backyard or not but uh, we want to talk about that tonight if you have your Bibles you can turn to Second Kings the 15th chapter and uh, we're going to read in verse 1 Uzziah, the son of Amaziah, began to rule over Judah in the 27th year of the reign of King Jeroboam, the second of Israel. He was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for 52 years. His mother was Jechaliah from Jerusalem. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, just as his father Amaziah had done. But he did not destroy the pagan shrines, and the people still offered sacrifice and burned incense there. The Lord struck the king with leprosy, which lasted until the day he died. He lived in isolation in a separate house, and the king's sons Jotham was put in charge of the royal palace, and he governed the people of the land. Kind of an interesting story, King Uzziah, uh, how that uh, some, in the, in the Old Testament, when Israel come in, when uh, when, let's, let's back up. When Moses brought the children of Israel out of, out of bondage in Egypt, and in Deuteronomy over and over again says, God said, I will bless you, but when you go into the land, I want you to take the land, and I want you to destroy all of the things that are there. I want you to destroy all the, all the idols and all of the uh, artifacts of worship that the other people have there, and I want you to get rid of them. Tear down the, the, the poles and everything that represents another god. Get totally completely rid of it. And uh, I think sometimes we as Christians may fall into that category to where we get saved. God said, I want you to leave the old world behind and leave those things, uh, tear them down and get rid of them and uh, not have them there anymore. When we all, we all get saved, there may, have been a, there may have been an old shrine that you used to worship at. Now, I know that sounds kind of funny because I know that probably not many of us have ever worshipped at a shrine. But your worship of a shrine might have been it might have been a hobby you had, or it might have been uh, a certain sport that you were involved in. It might have been uh, a car that you drove that, that was just your God. I mean, you actually placed these things on a pedestal that it consumed all of your time. I know there's people that get so involved in a lot of different things, in, in guns, in hunting, in, in racing, in uh, sports, in, uh, uh, in reading books. I mean, it could, it could go any way you look at it. Uh, and that you get so involved in it that it becomes your God and you barely have time to worship God. And that's kind of what we see here with Uzziah when he took over the king. He was only 16 years old. And, uh, but it said he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Now that's good. That's good. He was one of those kings that did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. So we see that he had good intentions. And so he was starting out right, but he didn't tear down the high places of the of the gods of the, of the other nations. And they had been left there. And it, when we asked the question, why didn't he tear them down? He said, well, the people wanted them. So he gave in, <coughs> he gave in to the uh, popular opinion of the day. The people still wanted them. And I guess uh, Uzziah just kind of weighed out the thing, said, well, they want it. And, and uh, I, you know, sometimes we feel like we can't uh, enforce or uh, come against the popular opinion. We can't uh, force our religion on somebody else. And, that, and that's true, we can't. 
But just because we can't force it on somebody doesn't mean that we shouldn't stand up for that uh, which was right. Now, as we look at Uzziah, uh, Uzziah's life, uh, he, we can't blame him completely because, listen to this, he did, uh, in verse 3, it says, as his father Amaziah did it that way. So he was following the teachings that he had from his father. His father uh, did the same thing. He left him up there. So he was just following along in the footsteps of his father. And I, we talked about that, I think, last week, that how that, you know, when you follow your father, uh, that may be good or it may be bad. And in this case, it was good to a certain point, but it wasn't good enough. And how is that with our relationship with God? We, we follow him to a certain point, but then we... We break ties and say, look, God, I, I, I want you Sunday morning, Sunday night, and even Wednesday night, but the rest of the week, I've got other things that are more important in my life. And so we see that that was his, his, uh, uh, the way that he followed. And the result of it was that he, he smote him with, with leprosy. And he was a leper until the day that he died. And so we see that uh, there were some old shrines that if he would have taken those down, he would have avoided the leprosy, and he would have, he would have lived longer, and he would have uh, had a much better uh, successful king, kingdom. And then we move on down to the, uh, the 32nd verse of, of 2 Kings, chapter 15. Let me uh, flip over my pages here. I, by the way, I'm reading out of a New Living Translation tonight, if I can get the thin pages separated there. And in 2 Kings, chapter 15, verse uh, 32 through 38. We see that Jothan was a son of Uzziah, began to rule over Judah in his second year in the reign of Pekan, Pekan's reign in Israel. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 16 years. His mother was Jerusha, the daughter of Zadok, and Jotham did which was pleasing in the Lord's sight. He did everything his father Uzziah had done, but he did not destroy the pagan shrines. And the people still offered sacrifice and burnt incense there. And he rebuilt the upper gate of the temple. And uh, let me see, I want to read some more there. Verse 36, and then the rest of the event of Jotham's reign, everything he did are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Judah. In those days the Lord began to send King Rezin of Aram and King Pekah of Israel to attack Judah. And when Jonathan, Jotham died, he was buried with his ancestors in the city of David, and his son Ahaz became the next king. So we see that Jothan comes along after Uzziah. He also was a pretty good guy. I, I think I'm getting some out of this, of being a pretty good guy, being, a, being an almost sold out, being halfway there, evidently is not good enough. Because verse 34, he did that which is right in the sight of the Lord. He did what his father Uzziah had done. He learned from his daddy. So do you see how important it is, the dads, that we teach our children not half the truth or not half the commitment or half the way, but we take them all the way. And, and so we see that by, by this, uh, uh, he didn't tear down the high places and they were not removed because con here continually, giving way to popular opinion, giving way to peer pressure when uh, uh, people wanted to continue their ways of worshiping that way. So after a generation or two, things just became accepted. It was that way under Uzziah, now it's that way under Jotham. I guess that's just the way it's going to be. And, you know, in the church world today, I think probably some people have come to that conclusion because we can always go back and say, I remember when things were a whole lot different than I can. And things are different in the church today than they were uh, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. Uh, a lot different. Uh, there's things that are except not, not that everything was right back then, but everything wasn't wrong either. And not that everything is right or wrong in the church today, but there are some things in the world today and in the, that in the world that has crept into the church and we've accepted it. And it looks like that's just the way that it's going to be. Uh, because the way the world lives, the way the world acts, some of the things they want to do. Uh, there's some people in the world that want to call themselves Christian and, and come to church and, and act like they're Christian, but yet their lives don't resemble that of a Christian at all. They're still living in sin. They're still involved in a lot of worldly activities that are ungodly. Not, not all worldly activities are wrong, but some of them are. And they're still involved in a lot of these things. And, and that's, it seems to be that that's the way a lot of people want to live today. And we get in trouble when we preach against certain sins. People don't like to, to hear that certain things are wrong. 
And uh, maybe it's almost like the church today said we've gone too, too far to turn back. How will we ever turn the church back to where we think that maybe it should be or where it needs to be? Amen. And uh, so you, you can always have this attitude, and a lot of people do. Well, you don't have to participate in it if you don't want to. You know, we, we've got the, we're, we're doing right, and over here there's all these things wrong. Well, you don't have to do that. Uh, that's just another, another cop-out or a scapegoat of people who want to do something. And, uh, uh, and, and they might have the idea that, well, they're not hurting anybody. You know, that people want to do their thing, they aren't hurting anybody. That's, that's totally wrong. Your life affects a lot of people. Uh, an adult, an adult parent, you, you affect the lives of your children. You may think that you're not. Uh, you're affecting the lives of people that watch you and you're influencing them. And, and so uh, eventually, just like it was with, with uh, Judah here, God reaches that place to where sometimes he said, enough is enough. And it says, verse 37, in those days the Lord began to send the enemies against Judah. So they were living in, in a fair amount of peace until God looked and saw that, you know, they're just going to continue in this way. They're not going to turn around. Uh, so he allowed the enemies to come against them. And, and uh, I think, I guess we could say it this way. Well, God says, I'm going to get your attention one way or another. You know, you may, you may think you can get by with halfway serving me and, and have one foot in, in the, on the ground and one foot in the grave or one foot in, in the church and one foot in the world. You may think you can get by with that, but you're only going to get by with it so far. And one of these days we wake up and God's got our attention when we're, when we're down and we've been struck and down, whatever it might be, by illness or, or a, a famine or, or a, the economy or whatever it was. And we're flying high and all of a sudden we're not flying high anymore. God said, look, I need to get your attention. I need to bring you back to where you were when you first came to me. And uh, so when people ignore God's call to repent, he will bring judgment. Judgment is coming. He's, he's a loving God. Yes, he is. But he's also a God of judgment. And, uh, you know, just your parents, if they love you at all, they're a, God of, they're a parent of love, but they're also a parent of discipline. If they don't discipline you and teach you how to walk the straight and the narrow way, then they're not the parent that they should be. They're allowing you to veer off the track and to go into areas that you shouldn't be going into. So because the parent did this, Sometimes the next generation will have to deal with the consequences of the bad choices of their parents. And that's what we see so far with, with, uh, with Uzziah and his son, <coughs> Jotham. And uh, so it looks like that, <coughs> excuse me, it looks like that this is the, this is the way that it's going to go and the way that it's going to continue to go. But you know what? I found this, that uh, you don't have to do something just because somebody else did it. You don't have to do something just because your, your parents did it. I believe that you can, you can break the generational curses. We, we talk a lot about you know, the sins of the father coming down on the next generation, you know, and we think that's just the way that, it, uh, that it's going to be, and it doesn't always have to be that way. It doesn't always have to be that way. So we see here two generations of pretty good guys. I wonder how many people in the church are pretty good guys, doing things almost right. And they're injecting that into the lives of their kids. They're doing pretty good, but not really good enough. So we look here in the 18th chapter of, of Kings, Second Kings, and we read about a king by the name of King Hezekiah. I'm going to read first eight verses of, king, of chapter 18. And Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, Begin to rule over Judah in the third year of, of King Hosea's uh, reign in Israel. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother was Abijah, and his daughter was Zechariah, uh, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, just as his ancestor David had done. He moved, removed the pagan shrines smashed the sacred pillars, cut down the Asherah poles. He broke up the bronze serpent that Moses had made because the people of Israel had been offering sacrifice to it. The bronze serpent was called Nehushtan, 
And Hezekiah trusted in the, Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before or after his time. And he remained faithful to the Lord in everything he did. And he did carefully obeyed the commandments of the Lord had given to Moses. So the Lord was with him, and Hezekiah was successful in everything he did. He revolted against the king of Assyria and refused to pay him tribute. And he also conquered the Philistines as far, as a, as far distant as Gaza. And uh, his territory from the southern, smallest outpost to the largest wall city. Now we're seeing a totally, totally different story here. The generational curse can be broken before him did right which was in the sight of the Lord to a certain point. But Hezekiah comes along and says he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but he, but he did it like his uh, father David did. Had to go back a few generations, amen. He, he had to go back to, to great, great, great grandpa and find out the way that he did it. And uh, so in, in, in 2 Kings 16, 2 and 3, let me read this. He did that which is inside of the right inside of the Lord, but followed the ways of the king of Israel. And this is talking about his daddy, Ahaz. So even to the sacrifice of his own sons in the fire to idol worship. So you see, Hezekiah was raised by a very, very ungodly man. And maybe that was what it took to stir him to see, you know what? I, I, my, my grandpa and my, my great-grandpa did pretty good but their pretty good led to this, to where the, 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 my, my dad was a very evil, wicked man that, that sa even sacrificed his own sons uh, in, the, in the worship. Amen. And so we see here that Hezekiah, as he did what was right in the in sight of the Lord, he saw the evil and the wickedness of his dad, and he began to tear down the places of idol worship. And uh, the scripture says that he followed the example of his father, David. Uh, several generations before. Now something about David, David messed up a lot. David by no means uh, was a perfect man, but this one thing, David never turned his back on God. Even in, in his uh, failures, he honored God. When he, when he sinned, he repented. And one of David's greatest prayers of repentance is found in Psalm 51, verse 10, when, when David had reached a place to where his sin grieved him so much. He lay in anguish because of what he had done, and he, and he cried out to God, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. So we see that uh, in eight, chapter 18, verse 5, he trusted in the Lord. He had faith in God. He followed the Lord, and he kept his commandments. And uh, verse 7 says, And the Lord was with him, and he prospered him wheresoever he went forth, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria and served him not. And Hezekiah took a stand and God blessed him. You see, God blessed him because uh, it, it, Judah was under the jurisdiction of uh, other nations and other kings. And, and so they had to pay tribute to him. And, and, uh, and uh, Hezekiah comes along and says, I'm not going to do it. He said, I'm going to rebel against this. I'm not going to support them any longer. And so this could cause a, a lot of problem. The king could rise up against Hezekiah, and Hezekiah was just put in place as a king there to, to, to rule that area so that they could make money and they could gain money off of it. So in, in verse 19, it says, When Hezekiah heard that, uh, uh, well, the king of Assyria was going to come against him. So when, when Hezekiah heard of the plan to destroy Jerusalem, he went to the Lord and began to seek God's help. So as he began his life, he did that was right. He tore down the, the things. He rebelled against an authority that was trying to lead them in a wrong direction. And he trusted God through it all. And said he came to, and when he, when he went to the Lord, he, in verse 34, and God said this, he said, I will defend this city. Now, Assyria was a great and a mighty nation. And it would almost look like it would be an impossibility for the little nation of Judah to be able to rise against the Assyrians and to defeat them. But let's see what it says in verse 35. How the God says, I will defend you. And God says that to somebody that is totally, completely uh, taken down all of the old uh, idols and the old uh, worship ways. This is what it says, verse 35. And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote the camp of the Assyrians. 
and a hundred fourscore and five thousand, or a hundred and eighty-five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. Verse 37, And the king of Assyria died when two of his own sons came upon him and killed him. God will fight your battles, amen, if you call on him. If you call on God when the situation seems impossible, God will be there for you. I love this scripture in Jeremiah 33 and 3. And I'll say this, only my family will understand Jeremiah 33, 3. That's, that's, that's a number that I like. He says, call unto me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. God will be there for you. If you call on God in the difficult situations, God will be there for you. So we need to tear down the old shrines. You leave them up. If you leave them up, you're allowing Satan to have an open door to come back into your life. And it'll eventually, it'll eventually bring destruction. Take a stand. Take a new stand for where you are. You're a new creation. And uh, don't live like you used to. And God will bless you and he'll go with you to the battlefields of life. And, and he'll fight against opposition that, that you don't see any way possible that you could ever, ever have a victory or ever overcome it. But you can. You can because the battle's not yours. The battle's Lord. But in essence, the whole story here tonight, when I just want to talk about tearing down old shrines. When you come to Christ, there was something in your life that really held your importance. We may not think that we, we worshipped it. Uh, go back, people used to say that people worship TV. They sit in front of the TV for hours and hours and hours and hours, and that's all they ever do is watch TV and don't have any time for God. Well, that, that can be a form of worship. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> Whatever it might be, when you come to Christ, if that thing held such importance in your life, <coughs> excuse me, better have another drink. If that thing held such importance in your life that you don't have time for God, then it's a shrine. So when you come to Jesus, begin to look around you. Begin to see who you are. Begin to see where you're going. And begin to ask God, God, do these things need to come down? Do I need to tear down the strongholds? And God said he would. Tear down the strongholds <coughs> to where the enemy lives. Tear them down and destroy them, get rid of them. Because if we, <coughs> if we leave up those old shrines, they're going to come back in. They're going to come back in and eventually they'll take over your life just like they did before. So think about this, amen. I don't know where you are. I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know if there's something that you just don't feel like you've got the, the joy of the Lord like you need to. You don't feel like you're where you used to be 10, 15, 20 years ago. You don't feel like God's as real to you as he used to be. Well, is there something that's creeping back in? I like Jesus said in this way in Revelation when he's talking to the church at Ephesus. He said, you're doing really good, but I've got something against you. You've left your first love. Now, why do people leave their first love? Because they get involved in something else. Why do people get divorces and leave their spouses? Because they leave their first love and they go back to something they shouldn't. And it's the same way with God. Don't be involved in something you shouldn't be. Commit your life to God. Do that which is right in the sight of the Lord. Tear down the shrines that don't need to be in your life. Totally sell out to God. And God will defeat your enemies for you. As you begin to hunger and thirst after God, God becomes more real in your life each and every day. You begin to seek Him more. You begin to follow Him more. You begin to be hungry for God and for His Word and for prayer time more. You're going to find out that you'll become stronger and stronger in the ways of the Lord. And you're going to find that you begin to live in victories that you never knew that were there for you. But you can. Amen. God bless you. I thank you for being with me tonight, you know, and and to think about these old shrines and begin to tear them down. But, uh, you know, come out uh, tomorrow night, if you would. And Sunday morning, Sunday school at 9.30, donuts at 9, 10.30 morning worship. Come and be with us. Come and be with us. I think you'll enjoy it. And it'll be a time where you, you feel like you're a part of something. And so we're glad that you're able to tune in with us on the, on the Internet and online. We, we thank God for that. That's a, it's been a wonderful tool. 
But um, I want you to be able to experience all that you can from Jesus Christ. Let me pray before I close tonight. Father, I praise you and I thank you, God, for all of your goodness. You're a wonderful God. Love you, Lord, with all my heart, all my soul, and all my mind. And I just pray for the people that are hearing your word tonight. God, that you'll speak to them, God, words that I can't even begin to speak. Lord, you'll speak to them with the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit, God. And draw them near to you, God. Break them down, Lord. Help them to realize that there's some things maybe they don't need in their life anymore. Help them to realize, you know, God, I need to draw near to you. I need to get closer to you, Father. Maybe there's somebody out there tonight that doesn't even know you. Lord, right now, speak to them, God. Help them to cry out and to call on your name and say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins and come into my life. It's just, just as simple as that. Just as simple as calling on the name of Jesus and asking Jesus to do a work in your life, and I believe he will. Amen. Praise God. Thank you for being with me tonight. We love you. and Give God the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.